Hello and welcome to the Gender Equality Academy webinar series. My name is uh, Vasya Rodesi and uh, I'm working as a project manager in Villas and I'm also uh, the, court, the deputy coordinator of this project. So today's topic is how to strategically frame gender equality policies and set priorities for change at your university. But uh, before uh, we start, I would like to give you a brief introduction uh, about what Gender Equality Academy is. So, uh, since we have uh, many gender equality programs and many projects and a great gain knowledge and experience uh, in such topics, there is still a, a small proportion of researchers and practitioners that are familiar with the theoretical and, uh, and methodological concepts of gender and feminist scholarship. So what uh, Gender Equality Academy does is that as an Horizon 2020 project uh, funded by the European Union's uh, Research and Innovation Program, it develops and implements a high quality capacity building program on gender equality in research, innovation and higher education. Through this project, we are offering a series of training sessions in different formats, starting from in-person trainings, interactive and participatory workshops, summer schools, distributed open collaborative courses, interactive webinars and train the trainer sessions. Unfortunately, uh, due to the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, we are unable to offer any face-to-face -face sessions, but we are continuing now with the interactive webinars. In different topics and we are also launching our open course uh, on June. So if you would like to stay uh, informed and uh, maybe learn more information about what the Gender Equality Project is about, you may visit our website gdacademy.eu. We are a, a consortium of partners, so we are 12 organizations, uh, different organizations throughout Europe, I'm representing Billups, uh, an innovation poll in Greece and Cyprus. So I'm speaking now from my home office in Thessaloniki. And um, before we start, actually, I wanted to let you know that we have contacted uh, a series of webinars that are available on our YouTube channel, Gender Equality Academy EU. And you can uh, subscribe and be the first to know when uh, a video is uploaded. So today we are also live tweeting about this uh, webinar. So you may also uh, visit and follow us on, on Twitter and tweet your impressions about the content of uh, today's webinar. And uh, last but not least, and I don't want to uh, take your, all of your time, uh, today's agenda will be presented by uh, my colleague uh, Maria San Giuliano. So without any further delay, I'm stop uh, sharing my screen and I'm giving the floor to Maria Sandiniano. Thank you, and I hope it will be very interesting for all of you. So, hello uh, to everybody and welcome also from my side. I'm Natasha Sega. And together mm, with Maria San Giuliano, today we will be the moderator and of this and organizer of this webinar. Um, let me just first start with some overview of what uh, our task is about and about a small technicalities of the platform we are now using. So mm, the, the goal of this Gender Equality Academy webinar series is to make in knowledge and good practices example available to a wider audience and uh, comp in a comp that and still uh, and still available uh, format what we will doing is uh, the, the is implementing uh, 12 webinars on several topics of gender equality between this year and next years uh, that will be related with the training a uh, physical training and workshop on similar issue that will hopefully start soon again um so, yeah. okay 
Today's webinar learning objectives is to, are to present a different discursive framework for the gender equality in research and higher education, to highlight discursive opportunities and tension between gender equality policies and mainstream um, higher institution policies, and provide example of strategic framing and priority setting. We will have two very interesting presentation, one from the professor Mick Verlo of the Radboud University in Nijmegen and the other one for, from professor Beatrice Beckschimmer, vice president of, the, of medicine in the Zurich University. Without taking much time, I just wanted to point out how, how this, uh, this webinar will be run. So we will have two, the two presentations given by the speaker that will be followed by a longer q and and interactive q and session. So during the speaker presentation, we, are, we will ask you to type your question using the question and answer button that you can find, uh, as you can see at the bottom, at the black bar at the bottom of your screen. And we ask you to use the chat box to interact with each other and to report any technical problem you may have in encounter. Let me immediately go to introduce you to our first speaker, Mick Verlo, that we're very glad to have here today. Mick is professor at the head title at the Radbo University in Nijmegen and is a non-residential permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Science in Vienna. She's also the winner of the 2015 European uh, Concourse on Gender in Policies Career Achievement Award and she also was scientific director of a large research project on gender equality policy making in Europe, like the King and the Magic project. Without taking further time, I ask um, Mike to, to start with their presentation. I think you can hear me now, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for this invitation and it's uh, strange. I see sunshine, I see trees and some flowers and then you are all listening to me and the flowers aren't. So um, I, yes, okay. Yeah, that's me. Um, from my home office in, in Nijmegen as uh, maybe most of you. Um, I'm going to speak to you about picking your battles, picking your rights, how to choose wisely between opportunities and uh, threats in changing your university towards gender plus equality. And as often, um, there is no simple answer to this question, how to choose wisely. Um, there is a, um, a saying in uh, the region where I come from that you have to think before you do something and while you're doing something, you have to continue thinking. So this is the best way, of course, of choosing wisely, but also it helps to have some more theoretical understanding of how these things can function. And um, today, I think the... Um, the focus is on framing and what that means. So now I don't know how I go to my next slide actually, because that does, yeah, okay. So um, I'm gonna say something about the basics, about how framing and societal change are related to each other. And I want to start with a caveat first, because of course, discursive processes and framing are important, in uh, gender equality change, but at the same time, it would be very naive to trust the side attention for the structures around it in a more classical sense. Uh, uh, resources, positions, uh, structures of decision-making are, are just as important 
the political opportunities around your universities are not all the same across countries. They are important as well. The mobilizing networks from which you can draw are different also in different contexts, and that matters also, but it's not the focus of today's uh, uh, webinar. So I think you have to take that into account. So what is framing? Uh, framing is how reality is understood and how the connection between parts of reality and goals for changing those parts of reality is made. So it, what it does, it, it makes event and circumstances, the whole reality intelligible and discussable by providing a language and a structure for discussion and action. And um, it means you, by talking about it, by framing it in a certain way, it's unavoidable if you talk about it, you describe reality in a certain way and other things like go into the background and that matters uh, a lot. Framing can be so common that it's almost invisible because everyone shares the same understanding and then it's not necessary to make that explicit. But also different entities like governments or boards of universities or faculties within university, they are all engaging in continuing to frame their reality and each of them in different ways. So think of different faculties, for instance, humanities will have a different understanding of what science is than the, um, often the hard social sciences like psychology often is or as part of sociology. They, they will understand what they're doing in a different way. Those faculties where groups of students are small, they will understand what they do in a different way. They will understand teaching in a different way than the faculties where are many students. So this is connected to reality but also to an understanding of reality and a representation of reality so framing in a way is a representation of reality now around any issue or any part of reality there's ongoing contestation in framing and this is of course extremely relevant when you ask for societal or for organizational change because that means there's a whole political dynamics already always in place. And if you want change, you are going to intervene in that dynamics. In, in the literature on framing, we, which comes predominantly from social uh, movement uh, theory and research, there are a couple of elements that are very important, which is how they diagnose the current situation. What is, what is happening there and what is not okay about it this is the diagnosis what is their prognosis with a call for action what should happen and who should do that and then who has voice in creating these representations of reality and of what should change so what you have to keep in mind is that framing is always a reduction of complexity and and it's this reduction of complexity that that has consequences. So Snow and Benford, which are some of the, the most, um, let's say, uh, hegemonic academic uh, authors that, that talked about framing in the term of social movement uh, theory, they introduced the term of frame re resonance to account for to account for the ability of a collective action frame to resonate or to appeal to a targeted audience. And that means they ask the question, under what conditions do framing efforts strike a responsive chord or resonate with the targets of mobilization? In terms of what we're talking about today, what you would like to know is under what conditions will framing efforts by people that want gender equality change strike a responsive chord with the targets of that uh, demand, with the people in the university boards, in the faculty boards, the people that organize human relations, the people that organize research programs, the people that organize teaching programs. So frame resonance is an important concept. It's about the conjunction of the content of framing by the change agents and the additional elements that are already in the milieu that you want to change. So it is always a process. 
in, um, in terms of, of concepts from discursive politics, framing involves always, it can involve fixing or shrinking or stretching or bending. So if, um, as, as uh, is a very common understanding in, in uh, gender equality, <coughs> if um, there is a lack of female uh, professors, then this can also become the only uh, description of the problem at universities that is taken into account. So that means that the whole goal of gender equality is, is uh, smaller, is shrinking from what it uh, could be. So a very important question is, what kind of framing, what kind of present representation of a problem or a solution will arouse the interests of all those people that are crucial in bringing about uh, change uh, in uh, universities? And at this point, uh, I would like to, uh, to ask you um, to um, shout in the chat, chat function uh, very quickly like the first things that come to mind, if you were to frame something as a problem in universities um, in, in, and you would try to um, be understood by people from the boards of the university that make decisions about what happens, what are the things that you would uh, say are a problem? And then I hope that Natasha will read them to me if you... If uh, yes, <laughs> you are invited to type in the chat box uh, the answer to the question that Mika just posed. So we have equal opportunities and efficiency in the house of human resources. Mm -hmm. Then we have an, uh, more awareness. We have finance. Um, we have another attendee that is typing that there is a high lack of awareness about gender equality. Someone else will say quality of research output. Yeah, I think we, we can we can go and with that. <laughs> diversity as well. <laughs> okay, okay, and diversity. Okay, yeah. we, we we stick with those uh, uh, already, and. Um, because I can come to, to, to some things that I uh, put on the slide already. So there's, of course, I could have made a, a series of slides of all the different framings that are used uh, to promote uh, gender equality. Um, and um, a few things that have been mentioned in this chat fall under what is called the business case for gender equality. So that, that is arguments like the uh, human resources will be more uh, efficient or it will be good for the finances of the university or it will be good for the quality of the research uh, output. Now what, what are the, the benefits of such a framing is immediately obvious because in the case of the business case for gender equality this is appealing to predominantly the neoliberal side of universities where they are uh, not always for profit organizations, but they um, are under very strict financial conditions and therefore they see anything that can contribute to their being more efficient or financially profitable um, as a, a good thing. So that means if you frame gender equality in those terms, uh, you will have their ears. They will listen to you because what you do is you say you have this goal and um, uh, what I want uh, will promote that goal that you have. So in that, in that sense, it's, um, it's um, a good idea to do that. And I will come back later to uh, the, the dangers that might be uh, involved. Um, equal opportunities falls into um, a framing of justice that you appeal to a more shared value of universities in Europe that um, they, they should um, provide education in a just way. They should not 
just be elite universities. So you can already see that this probably will go down well with some universities and not with others. And um, if you look at the um, other uh, arguments that you mentioned, um, that you tell them there is a lack of awareness for gender equality, this um, you can see is uh, definitely it starts from a feminist understanding of what is the problem and it will need to, to have a narrative attached to that to explain to university boards like why is this lack of awareness for gender equality a problem for them unless uh, this is university that has already declared gender equality as something that they want to engage in and um, so it, it's a frame that can be used and that will be used predominantly in those cases where the goal has already been uh, adopted. And the same is a bit the case with the, with the uh, understanding of gender equality as diversity. This will go down if uh, people um, already have such a kind of uh, goal and it will be much more difficult uh, to talk to universities that have never thought about this in the first place. So it's just a little bit um, to, to give you the idea what kind of framings about gender equality might be around. There are as many as there are universities, probably because they are often very uh, contextual. So um, it's... Um, uh, and, and we will have in the second presentation uh, by Beatrice uh, Beck-Schimmer also reference to the famous uh, um, differences between or, or different uh, goals of gender equality in terms of fixing the numbers, fixing the institutions or fixing uh, the knowledge. And, and uh, it only shows that in all these cases the complex reality of the problem of gender inequality at universities is reduced to some things that uh, are then uh, put on the table. And universities across countries differ in that. So in the references at the end of my presentation, you will see a reference, for instance, by to an article by Nielsen from uh, Scandinavian countries comparing the Danish, the Norwegian and the Swedish universities. And um, so in, in, in there, um, he notices that the Norwegian and the Swedish universities, they, they mix arguments and framings in terms of utility or innovation or justice and anti-discrimination. And the Danish universities uh, refer frame it as in terms of competitiveness and utility and innovation. So you could say the Danish universities in that um, refer more to the business case and uh, the Swedish and the Norwegian uh, uh, universities also frame it in terms of, of justice and equality. Um, so it's um, not just uh, about uh, gender equality, of course, because it's also the case that within the framing of, of gender equality, um, the case of gender mainstreaming is a crucial one. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, I think in, when it comes to change towards uh, gender equality, um, it's different whether one frames in terms of solutions that are targeted actions um, that, that target directly those uh, people or those elements uh, of an organization that cause the problem, um, or in terms of gender mainstreaming, which is a much more comprehensive and complex understanding where uh, as all the routines and um, practices that are present in a certain context contribute to continuing gender inequality. So um, they, they ask for a different understanding and whereas the scope of targeted actions is much smaller, the scope of gender mainstreaming is, uh, is very, very uh, large. 
And um, it might seem that then you have to choose between the two, but in fact, you don't. Because they, they can be there simultaneously. But at the same time, the framings for targeted action, once you have, you, once you have for instance, uh, framed it in terms of uh, women that are not assertive enough or women that do not have enough role models, then it will become more difficult to combine that with a framing that says that the organization is working in, in, a, in, a, in a way that includes too many gender biases. So these things uh, can sit uneasily with each other and it's good uh, to consider this uh, uh, before. So when then framing gender, in, gender equality is also intersectionality, of course, is key. And uh, I was very happy that someone already mentioned diversity as one of the um, arguments or framing uh, about uh, gender equality. And it's also what the plus in the title of my presentation tends to uh, point at. Um, because we know that gender never comes alone. We know that gender is not binary. Um, that means that in framing um, what is the problem about gender or what should be done uh, about gender equality in, in universities, we need to, to also frame the importance of gender versus the importance of class, race, ethnicity, sexuality, disability. And in that, what matters is not what is most important, but how these things are interlinked. Uh, I remember clearly a case from my university where we were talking with a board um, who, who was more or less supportive of gender equality and um, who they were congratulating themselves on doing so well. I think we had the highest number of uh, female professors in that year or something, so they thought they were doing fantastic. And then we told them, well, you know, in this uh, region, um, we know that the university captures very small percentages of the people from migrant background that live around Nijmegen. So Nijmegen is a very regional university, has lots of its students that come from the region, but not all of the students from that region have an equal chance of ending up at university. Yet they had never considered that to be a problem. So they had never considered that to be linked somehow to um, how their gender equality uh, position at university uh, was. So this, uh, what this means also is that if you omit attention for other inequalities than gender, it will reduce also the quality of gender equality change. And, and of course, here too, you can see that in terms of frame resonance, uh, certain things might, be, might go down more easily with the board of the universities than others. And this, of course, is also context uh, dependent. Radboud University being in the Netherlands, then and it has a, a pink uh, lunch every uh, week uh, somewhere. So this means that sexuality is not a difficult thing to put on the agenda here, um, but uh, race ethnicity uh, is because uh, migrant backgrounds not considered to be part of that in, to a large extent. And um, so, so this, this uh, might be uh, different. And a last thing I want to say about intersectionality is that I think one should always be aware of framing intersectionality as about identities, as about we should have a mix of identities in our university. Uh, intersectionality is about structural inequalities uh, in society. And um, I think this is, this is not the same as identities. And, and um, in, in that sense, it might be a problem to frame it as such because it it takes you away from ideas about discrimination or disadvantage in society and it brings you more into the line of um, cultural differences that can be um, essentialized. Okay, so I've um, introduced uh, framing, I've introduced the 
specifics of uh, uh, gender equality. Now, how can we think about the dangers of frame resonance tactics and strategies? And there is many things uh, you can say about that, but I want to say a few things about that. Um, so this, this is that resonance is important. If you want to engage regular actors, and given the fact that feminists are not the boss of universities, you want to engage regular, regular actors, and then it's unavoidable to frame strategies and measures as meaningful, experientially commensurable, or familiar and positive to the people that you want to engage uh, with your uh, change uh, strategy. So you can't avoid trying to talk their language. You can't, you cannot avoid trying to um, bridge to the way they see uh, reality. But you have to keep in mind that what is meaningful in one place is not necessarily the same elsewhere. So that means that if you hear about a certain way of describing the problem at universities uh, and you want to take that uh, you want to copy that in your university, you have to first consider whether this, this, this would work in the same way um, uh, in your university. Remember what I said about this research uh, studying Denmark, Norway and uh, Sweden, uh, it would not be a good idea for a Danish uh, researcher to unthinkingly uh, use this kind of uh, justice or anti-discrimination framings that worked in the Norwegian or Swedish context uh, because in the in the Danish context it might not work that way. It doesn't mean you cannot use them at all, it means you cannot use them in exactly the same way. It will work in a different way. So the literature about frame resonance also stresses mostly that uh, there is a need for credibility and consistency. So the way you describe the problem, it needs to appear convincing, it needs to be credible, it needs to um, um, and, and this involves a ch choice from all the things you could say, uh, all the facts that you might highlight and the norms that you might highlight and um, you're probably going to avoid direct contesting because you're trying to bridge towards these uh, regular actors. It's important, path dependency is important, so um, framing at the time of its introduction, so if you start the whole uh, discussion with boards of the university uh, at a certain point in time, the way you describe the problem at that point in time will necessarily set the terms for its further development possibilities. It's difficult to change points of view uh, later on. And um, there is always uh, a danger of rhetorical entrapment. So you need to always be alert not to be swept away by the mainstream. All the framings you use can be used against you. If you try to, to make a business case argument that this will increase the number of female students, and then that doesn't happen, it will be reason enough to stop the whole program. So um, you have to be very uh, aware of that. But in all these cases, frame resonance um, has a consequence for the alliances that you can make. So first of all, if there are already alliances, you are more probable of taking on board their representation of reality, their representation of what the problem is or the things they, they are engaged in anyway. Um, but also any way you frame it will structure uh, uh, future alliances. So this is uh, what most of the, the literature on framing uh, tells you, but there is also some people that are more, um, that contest this. So Francesca Poletta and uh, Kai Ho, they stress that ambiguity and inconsistency can be more powerful sometimes uh, than clarity and cohesion. And I remember at some point uh, also, so disruption of this kind of um, more rational way of behavior can sometimes bring you uh, success. So, uh, and, and, but you also need to have a story about that, right? So you have to, uh, you have to then be able to say, well, you know, we are, 
um, having internal contestations on that or we changed our mind or uh, we have new research or you have to have a narrative uh, that uh, connects uh, to that. So I'm coming towards the end of my uh, presentation and uh, there's two things more I want to do. So um, uh, I want to reflect with you a little bit on strategic framing in times of Corona or COVID-19, whatever you want to uh, refer to it. So, because this is a times of crisis now, and uh, in terms of crisis, emerging framings of the crisis tend to become uh, hyper uh, dominant. So it will be unavoidable somehow to connect it to that. And um, I, in the questions and answers, I would like to hear from you also, if you already noticed this or, uh, what you expect um, will be the consequences of that. Because what I think is uh, surely to be expected is that framings that postpone attention for gender equality till everything is normal again are to be expected. So this is the, a, a classic reasoning in, in, um, in organizational change where um, any, any crisis is used to say, no, 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 no. Now we have to first address the big crisis and then we can um, address uh, gender equality again. So the, the obvious counter framing to this, of course, is the, the classic, but the normal was a problem already. So we surely need to mainstream gender equality in the actions that address this crisis. And, um, in, in that sense, it would help to see the corona crisis as a major change in the discursive opportunity structure. And um, in terms of strategic framing, uh, that means that because maybe universities will uh, have to change uh, the way they operate um, very seriously, um, you, you can use displacement maybe even or realignment and not just revitalization. So you can, you can maybe come with, with more radical demands um, because there will be more uh, radical changes uh, already. And, um, but even in times of Corona, it's good to take into account also that the availability for all universities in Europe of anti-gender equality frames is growing and um, they can be expected to be used by opponents also within uh, universities. And um, that will need ongoing attention uh, as well. Okay, so... Um, I said that uh, framing can be successful if it rouses uh, the interests of the, the actors that are supposed to uh, contribute to the change in universities that you are expecting. Um, the so successful framing always involves stretching the goal of gender equality in some parts to uh, the way they interpret, interpret reality, um, zooming in and out of parts of this in such a way that you, you get some kind of frame resonance and alliances can be made for action. This is always dangerous. It always involved uh, that uh, the goal of gender equality can be bent to other goals and you can lose the goal uh, altogether. So one tactic that is useful uh, for this is uh, reflexivity because it calls for ongoing thinking about the consequences of framings that are used. And uh, one way of increasing reflexivity, reflexivity is um, self-problematization. So there is that you ask yourself or the group that you work with continuously, like, um, well, what does it mean that we do it this way? Uh, how do we restrict our future actions by saying it this way? Uh, one way of increasing reflexivity is by role-playing before, while, and after engaging in actions so that you, you say, well, you, you will uh, get the role of opponent or you will get the role of a university board that is uh, the financial director or you will have um, the goal of the human resource uh, director that wants to make a further career, uh, anything like that. And, and you let them react to uh, what you do and you see whether some of these dangers that are theoretically to be expected actually uh, materialize 
is a way of trying to um, give yourself more creativity in um, further decisions about how you want to frame this. So this is my uh, talk and I'm looking forward to your questions and to the next presentation first. Okay, thank you, Mika, for your super interesting presentation. I'm going now to introduce you with our second speaker, Professor Beatrice Beck Schimmer, who is a full professor of anesthesiology at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, and also vice president president medicine at the university, in charge of leadership and management of the Faculty of Medicine. She was previously holding the role of Vice Dean for Academic Career Development and Equal Opportunities at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Zurich. Beatrice, without further delay, the floor is yours. Oh, I'm almost there. Sorry. Hello to everybody. Um, I'm very uh, delighted to be here and uh, to interact with you. Also, it's the same for me. It's a little bit weird. I'm not that used to it. I'm an anesthesiologist originally, and uh, I like interacting with people, of course, with uh, patients or with uh, colleagues. But ne nevertheless, we do uh, our very best and I think it's a, it's a great opportunity, you know, to share some ideas with you. And I think I follow, um, it's a kind of follow up of the first presentation. I think this is a perfect fit. And um, I will show you a little bit what we, we did. I mean, we were talking a lot, a lot about framework uh, at our faculty. And I have to highlight that I will specifically talk, of course, about the Faculty of Medicine. But I assume you can also um, transfer it to another field. Also, we heard that it may be a little bit di uh, different. So I was, um, you know, we had a lot of discussions and I thought, well, maybe we need some actions, maybe five or eight years ago. And I will give you an overview how we, um, how we did that and uh, what kind of ideas we had, what kind of visions, what kind of uh, business plans. And I think this is the most important thing for me. You know, when you want to convince people and uh, let's say I'm now a, a board member of the executive board of the university. And I was, of course, when I interacted with these people, with uh, now my current colleagues, I had to convince them. And I think this is very important. We have um, a, a gender equality office, which provides us with, with numbers. And you can see here, this is a, a brief overview uh, from 2009 to 2018. And you see here the fainted colors. You can see here uh, the percent, this is on the left side here, of women professors at the University of Zurich. So this is this line here, slightly increasing. And you also see the men, the male uh, colleagues here, um, slightly going down. Um, 
Yeah. Now, when we focus on, on the faculty of medicine, these are the bright colors. Uh, you, you can see it's a similar picture. And finally, we end up here uh, with 14% uh, female professors we have at the faculty of medicine. I think this is a very bad number. Also in comparison, we have seven faculties with the other six faculties. I think we are really at the end of, of the queue. And here, I just wanted to show you um, the numbers again, referring to the different uh, years. And uh, you can see here the different uh, professorships. We have full professors in blue. We have in orange associate professors and we have assistant professors in, in gray. And in addition, you see here um, the, the new appointments. This only refers to, to women at the Faculty of Medicine. And you, you can see here 2018, we did extremely poorly because we did not even appoint one single woman. I'm sorry, I show you, it's a fact, I show you the data, but I'm, I'm really ashamed. And I think you all know the, the leaky pipeline. You all know this, this kind of scissor, right? And uh, this graph here refers to, to the development. So let's say someone starts as a student, uh, admission student, etc., postdoc. And finally, you can see here um, the the, 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 the percentage of, of women or also men, in blue men and in gray uh, women, how many end up in our faculty as associate or full professors. And you see clearly here, and I think this is not unique for our faculty, this is also for other faculties, you can see that there is somewhere here the gap starts in the postdoc uh, phase. And also again here, um, the numbers refer to 2018, we only have 8% associate and full professor, women professor at our faculty. So this is clear, something has to change. Um, I don't think I have to convince you. And we heard that already, you know, I'm a big fan of Londa Schiebing because you know, what we discussed, it became evident that we have to interact at different levels. You know, probably it's not enough if you want to change something just to try to increase the numbers of women or to fix the knowledge. Uh, but in parallel, we have to, to tackle all these different uh, issues. So um, what's the idea? The idea is really to, to increase the number of women. And of course, I always refer to the faculty, but this could be anywhere, right? Um, I just show you the examples here, but I think um, with a, maybe some differences, you can also apply it, let's say, in medicine to the heads of uh, departments uh, in, in hospitals in general. Fix the institution, so we really need structural change. I'm convinced personally that we can, we can try to increase the number of women, but for this, we really need a structural change. I will come back to that. And finally, this is also very important, uh, specifically in medicine, you know, we have to integrate sex and gender related differences in medicine. Uh, you will not believe it, or some of you may know it, right? We have the prototype, uh, a man, the man, a male um, person, and, uh, and for women we say, okay, this is a, well, this is something different, and this would really change. And I think this should also change at the level already when, when we interact with uh, medical students. So let's start with fix the numbers of women. What did we do? What, uh, what was our goal? You know, many years ago, we established mentoring because we think mentoring is 
extremely important, not only for women, but particularly for women. I think uh, it allows women to better interact, to better, to, to have a better network. And it could be a group mentoring or a one-to-one -one mentoring. And I think it, it is a bottom-up um, activity. This is very important. We have contracts between mentees and mentors, but it's always coming from side of the mentees. You know, they, they, um, uh, they try to figure out where they have a problem in, in, in medicine. Is it in, in their clinical activities? Is it uh, referring to research? Or is it uh, a problem with their family? When should they have children? And in, importantly, you know, we opened this program not exclusively for women. That's important. This was very important for all these aspects. I will show you that we do it for, uh, for uh, male and uh, for men and, and women. And I, wish, I will explain that to you, or maybe at the end I can ask a question, why do you think that was very important? Women in science, visibility is important. You know, uh, we, should, we have only a few women, but they are excellent. We should try to make them visible. This was a pro program, or is it still a running program, from side of the university for all faculties. Whenever we have new uh, hired person, uh, a, a woman, a new professor, then we, we try to present them, we, ha we have a booklet, and I think this is uh, very important. The third action, this is a big one, we started with, uh, with this program in 2014, we, only, we almost have one million Swiss francs per year available for this pro program. And um, we defined it as career development program. It's not exclusively for women, but with a clear focus on women um, who have a family, who are, um, have maybe are at the later stage of their career. They are already a little bit older because they had children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, you can see we have three pillars. We have the planning, the mentoring, and the financial support, which I already highlighted. So we consider it as, as important that um, these persons um, try to, to have uh, a planning, a long-term planning with the head of the department. And you, we are all aware, you know, of the fact that in medicine, the hierarchy is extremely steep. And we are also in a country where uh, the, the career planning is uh, as a physician or a physician scientist is not well defined. For example, I spend a lot of time in the US and there, for example, when you start as a resident, as a young doctor, you have a planning for the next four or five years, which makes life much easier. So this is different here. You always have to figure out uh, if you change the hospital, if you change the field. So here we try to encourage people, but also the head of the departments to interact and to, to come up with a long-term perspective, long-term for us means three to four years. Then the mentoring, I don't go in details anymore. I already highlighted that. Here, um, we always try to, to connect the mentee with the mentor from a different field. Let's say me as an anesthesiologist, I should not take someone from my community. And I think this makes sense because um, this will give, hopefully, the mentees uh, a broader view. And finally, uh, the financial support. So we, were, um, we are very uh, fortunate in the situation that we uh, each year, uh, even under financial uh, constricts, constrictions, that we get all this money from the University of uh, Zurich. And we pay a kind of protected time, time uh, which um, um, the, 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 uh, the physician scientists can use for the research. And this is very important that they have a clear focus on the research and that 
that they are not on call in the hospital and then in between they go to the lab or they try to perform the clinical study. So we pay 20 to 50 percent and we have to make sure that they really get this time. So they have a different contract for this research time um, with the University of Zurich and the rest, uh, let's say, um, um, 30 uh, to 50 percent with the according hospital. I forgot to add, you know, this program allows you to uh, get financial support for two years with an additional prolongation of one year. We thought it's important that you also have for a certain time frame uh, a certain security, you know, so that you are, you can say, okay, I have a, I can really focus now on research between 20 and uh, 50% for at least two years. And we are very, um, I think, uh, positive on, on really giving funding for another year. Fix the institution. As I already mentioned, for me, this is the most important uh, step um, and I think um, years ago, a program was uh, established, Search for Women Excellence. And they, this, this um, program has two goals, two goals which were defined, uh, namely, um, there should be at least one third female applicants when they apply, when there is a, a, a professor position available. And the shortlist should uh, include at least one third um, uh, or 30% women, which um, is unfortunately not uh, always the case. Or then, as you remember the numbers, they are not uh, listed as number one. When I started as Vice President of Medicine in August 2018, I tried to figure out with, uh, with the Gender Equality uh, Office, with a lot of colleagues also from other faculties, with my uh, executive board uh, members, with my colleagues there, we tried to figure out how we could redesign the recruitment process, which I think is already good, but obviously we are not very successful. And um, we, we found out that we have extremely huge units. I give you an example, our department of anesthesiology at the University Hospital in Zurich, we have around 140 physicians and just one head. So this person, the head is responsible for clinics, uh, for research. Um, he's the head of the de department, so he's the leader, his leadership um, tasks, etc. bureaucracy issues, so um, teaching, education. So I think this is just not possible anymore. And I also have to say, you know, years ago we had a kind of dinosaurs we professors with the according education and maybe they were able to, um, to lead such a huge uh, unit. But I think these days, this is just not possible anymore. So we try to, to um, have several, we, we try to design several units out of one huge one. And uh, as you can see here, uh, for anesthesiology, this would mean we have a professor for, uh, for pain, pain clinic, a professor for cardiovascular and pulmonary anesthesia, and maybe uh, a third one. This is still to be defined. So this is very important and I would only do that or we, we envisage that only for really large units. And for example, for the university hospital here in Zurich, I think we have two or three such uh, such units. And then also we try to, um, let me show you the next slide, maybe this is a little bit more clear. So this is the recruitment process. You can see um, in a first approach, it's very important when we, we try to hire a new professor and this professor should also be the director of a department, we need a consensus 
between the hospital and the university. I don't go in, into details with that, but that's very important because otherwise, you know, after uh, when the hiring process finishes, the hospital sees a candidate and the university uh, sees a candidate or prefers a candidate, and this makes it very difficult. So we have the commission work. You can see here, we have the call then. We think about headhunting, also to make younger talents more visible, particularly women. And um, we try to um, implement new assessments, also referring uh, to leadership, and most importantly, we really would like to have uh, and adhere to, to DORA criteria, to criteria where we uh, less focus on um, numbers. Because also there we are all aware of the fact that if uh, a woman is a little bit, I say that in a positive way, but a little bit delayed, you know, it's more difficult, let's say, to have a higher age factor in, in research than a male colleague and and this way you know we we try also to approach uh, this possible bias the third one uh, the final one so uh, fix the knowledge in sex and gender in medicine here we have uh, since 2018 a commission sex and gender in medicine this commission uh, tries to establish local and international ne networks and is extremely active in implementing uh, this topic into the curriculum of, of our uh, medical students. And here we had uh, extremely uh, efficient and great support with a visiting professor, with Professor Vera regitz Sakrosek from the Charité from Berlin. And she, um, she really, um, she was here for four months only. And now we hired her, her for 20% uh, because with her spirit she has, she approach, approaches those sense and she try really to convince them that um, this topic of sex and gender in medicine should be implemented in, in, in the, the curriculum. But of course, it's also important afterwards um, for, for the physicians, for the doctor, to think about that and, and to, to, to go for diagnosis, therapies, whatever, and to think about uh, the differences we, we have. And for this, we established a, a certificate of advanced studies. And of, unfortunately now, this, uh, um, these, uh, this program should start in May, but of, because of Corona, we had to postpone it now uh, for a year. So we try to approach physicians, researchers, and, and try to show them uh, in the different fields of medicine how important it is and what they should focus on really to, um, which would allow us to fix this, this knowledge gap. And you see here, this is out of, of our booklet we have, uh, the portrait of the female faculty. And uh, I would say, yes, we can. And I finish with a, a quote which I always uh, use in, in uh, or I, 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 I start um, convincing people also in the executive board. I think we should not talk the talk, but we should really walk the talk now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, um, for um, a very interesting uh, presentation, and also to um, uh, to Mike. Uh, it was very nice to have a complete picture from a more, uh, let's say, uh, theoretical uh, part from uh, Mike on strategic framing, and then the possibility through uh, Beatrice. Um, uh, speech to uh, look at a very uh, specific and context-based uh, experience of uh, trying uh, and let's say uh, being successful as I understood in triggering institutional change. Uh, we are now um, starting collecting your questions uh, through the uh, question and answer uh, function uh, that you find at uh, 
bottom bar of the um, platform. Um, we are sorry for because we are a bit uh, delayed, but we hope that uh, you can still uh, uh, be, with, be, be with us uh, for a while. Um, I would open uh, with uh, two questions. Um, and uh, in the meantime, we collect uh, more from our audience. Um, so uh, to Mike, um, uh, I, would, I would ask, um, it, would, it was really um, interesting to hear uh, about the tensions uh, between uh, the need for uh, uh, reaching a consensus uh, within a given institutional context and its uh, stakeholders. And then on the other side, uh, uh, the need for um, keeping uh, the uh, issues and the goals of gender plus uh, equality uh, in a way safe for uh, being um, uh, used instrumentally. I would say, right? Um, so you, um, you recalled the importance of uh, reflexivity and critical reflexivity to this point. Um, and I, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, do you think that also in a way uh, building um, safe networks uh, of closer allies uh, would work um, and how possibly? Uh, and then to Beatrice, um, I think it would be interesting to hear from you. You presented really uh, a complex uh, um, diagnosis that you uh, conducted in a way, um, and this uh, way of approaching uh, all the three levels, uh, fixing women, uh, fixing um, uh, the institution and fixing knowledge. Uh, did you use um, a multi, I mean, different uh, frameworks to uh, advocate for change across the different um, uh, levels? Uh, and which one uh, eventually proved to be uh, more uh, successful in, in triggering change? Mike? Yeah. Um, we can, hear you. can people see me also? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, I, I think you, um, you talk about this, this, uh, this idea that, so you seem to assume in what you ask that it's the, let's say, the, the people who have some type of power position at university that have this more instrumental approach versus uh, us that have more a feminist approach. And uh, I think, first of all, I need to debunk that kind of distinction. No? I mean, I remember in, at the beginning of women's studies in Nijmegen, and that was in the 80s, so that's really long ago, was really early in the history of gender studies. Um, our biggest ally was a guy in the board of the university who was a Jesuit. But because we had feminist theology in Radboud University and we were a, a Catholic university that prided in itself on being progressively Catholic and therefore also having feminist theology. And that meant that he as a Jesuit and as a theologist, he had close friendships with that feminist theologian. So he, he thought that feminism was something that belonged to our university. So he did not have uh, an instrumental approach at all. So in, in that sense, I think it's true, right? And the more neoliberal university is, the more you can expect this instrumentality to, to, to dominate everything. But it's not the only uh, flavor in town ever. So there's always also people that care about other things, that care about that our first generation student themselves uh, and that care about this or that have uh, ambitious daughters and that care about that. Uh, so in, in that sense, or that have political perspectives that are about justice and anti-discrimination. So it's, um, it's, it's I think, not just this, this um, 
this uh, juxtaposition that they are like this and we are like that. And we, we have lots of liberal feminists that truly believe that this instrumentality is the only thing that it needs to be fixed. So it's, um, you, you ask if building safe networks of closer allies um, would be good. And I think it, it's, it's, first of all, it's needed that you look at it in, in a certain way, that you, that you look at it in a way that you think, but what are these other people's representation of the reality at our university? Do they think there is a problem? Some do. Some really see that inequality and gender inequality is a problem. You, they, they, they are a different type of allies, right? Because you can connect to them in a, in a different way. So in that sense, yes. I don't know what you mean with safe uh, networks, because one other thing that is important is also um, to, and this part of this reflexivity is kind of like, how can you, what kind of exercises can you do if you're a group of change agent? Uh, what kind of exercises can you do? What kind of actions can you take to make sure you're not caught into this instrumental thinking around you because that's the normality around you. So of course you're gonna be uh, you know, caught in that. Um, but, but what can you do? So Francesca Poletta, she, she talks about safe spaces, free spaces, yeah? Spaces where you can think aloud with people that are um, open to, to the same goal. No, because feminists don't share the same understanding of what is the problem, right? They, they differ among, uh, among themselves as well. But you can have a free space in which you can think of like, what would be the most absurd argument that we can use? No? And, and you can make fun of that. You can, you can try and develop your creativity in this. So that's also why I think for the reflexivity, I thought maybe role playing works because it, it somehow we have, you know, practical knowledge about our opponents. We have practical knowledge about the people at universities through all our routines and practices of engaging uh, with, with research directors, with teaching directors, with, with people in, in decision-making positions. And if you do role play, you tap into this practical knowledge uh, because suddenly when they tell you, you're the research director, you're going to react in a different way to, uh, to an argument that you, that you would have, might have put to them yourself. Uh, and this might help you in then, then constructing. Uh, and, and if you do that as a group, it will increase your, um, it will increase your knowledge, right? So, uh, and your reflexivity. So, and it can be fun as well. I mean, it, I think is one of my secret ingredients of, of, of trying to make change happen is add a touch of glamour, add a touch of fun. Um, because you have to keep your own motivation going as well. And um, if, if you have only one uh, story to tell, then you're gonna be bored in the end, no? I mean, this is the example that, that uh, in, in Nijmegen with Yvonne Benchop and we, we wrote about uh, gender equality change uh, projects together a couple of times. At, at one point uh, in the 90s, we were asked to write a gender equality plan for the faculty. And uh, we did so, and it was a highly contested thing to do. Um, so it was also boring we were, because we were trying to be very strategic and mentioning things that we think they might be doing and going to talk to people to make sure they would agree with it. At the same time, we knew there was a counter plan uh, in the making from people who opposed us. And uh, we, we put in the plan before its public discussion, we put in an element that said there should be free uh, sanitary napkins and tampons on all the toilets at university. Because we, we thought, okay, let's see who has read it, right? Because lots of people will come to this discussion, they will not have even read it. So let's see if anyone dares to mention this. Like, no, 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 this cannot happen, no? And of course, it was not mentioned by anyone in the discussion, but both Yvonne and me, we had such a good time in trying to, in, in, in like waiting, like, will anyone mention this? Should we mention it? You know, because it, it will somehow, it made us feel a little bit less anxious about what they might say.
Um, Maria, we cannot hear you. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. And Beatrice, uh, beside my question, I see that there are a few more for you in the, in the chat box, right? Um, Maybe let's just let me give you a quick answer to your question about the frames and the arguments. I think we can say we had content wise uh, arguments which are well known. I think um, I don't have to um, mention them in detail. But on the other side, we had also stakeholder wise uh, arguments. And I think this was very important. You know, we approached different people at different levels in different institutions in different fields at the end it was not an idea of uh, gender equality um, office and my female colleagues but we, we tried to recruit a lot of male ambassadors and this was very important um, for us and i think we did i mean they had their own arguments whatever um, but I think this was very important, you know, and I think this is um, particularly the redesign for the appointments. I had a lot of interactions with the faculty members and at the very beginning, you know, whoa, they were not at all amused. But then I think we tried to, to have ambassadors with a strong voice who helped us, who tried to convince the community. Just to, to give you this, this uh, Brief answer. Thank you. Natasha, uh, can you point yes. at a few qu more questions? Yes, of course. From our audience. So, um, to Beatrice, we have some, um, some question about mentoring specifically. So, um, what does this, uh, the mentoring contract include and also how it is e evaluated and what are the results in your university? I would start with them. Uh, to, mm -hmm. to then, if you can continue uh, telling us uh, if you uh, came across also negative responses from women and also from men in um, your new approach at the Zurich University and how, if it happened, did you deal with them? Yeah, referring to your question with the mentoring, we have currently an ongoing study and uh, we already had after two years an evaluation which was quite positive you know people really think particularly women you know they they got a certain support they were able to make the next step within their uh, career um, they became more visible in in our community so i think this looks extremely positive we also evaluate and i think this was also one of the questions it's very important or comments that we have um, longitudinal studies, right? So we do that also with, with our program. And of course, um, to evaluate sus sustainability, it takes a long time. Maybe we have, we are successful after 10 years or 15 years, right? So this is also important, you know, we cannot establish a program only for one, two or four years, because I think it would be very difficult you know to 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 have positive results and uh, from there from uh, just after also two or three years a, sh a, sh a short evaluation it became evident that also there the mentoring is crucial but also that it's very difficult for certain uh, particularly female colleagues that they get the research time and uh, so we will at one of the next faculty meetings we will give feedbacks and, and we try to encourage the, the the head of the departments you know to to really uh, support the program to support their um, young uh, talent and referring to the question with the redesign yeah that's that was really a big issue. We are still um, in, in full discussion with everybody. So we have uh, we have now a commission for the reappoint for the appointment for anesthesiology for the three professorships, 
and uh, that was very delicate and at the very beginning I was not sure if it would be uh, successful but there it was the most important thing was really to convince people to 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 be with with, within our group and then to convince other colleagues so um, you know this network to establish a strong network um, and I think there we could really see you know we have a lot of um, um, particularly male colleagues and they are not used to, to new models of leadership let's say it this way <laughs> in a very polite way and uh, I, think, I think we were successful in at least trying to, to convince them that we can perform a pilot. So we define it as pilot, we will monitor it, and it's not the way that we will now restructure the entire hospital or university or the faculty of medicine. So I think this was one of the strongest arguments, you know, that they said, okay, we will see and we have to define you know what are the next step if we are not successful that we can go back to the old structure and uh, let's see uh, i'm a little bit nervous but uh, we are we are working on it thank you beatrice similar uh, in a way to the to the way um quotas uh were were promoted as temporary measures to um like uh, uh, let's say uh, enhance uh, their being more uh, accepted. Uh, we have a few more questions in the chat box, um, but in, at the same time, uh, we as we are uh, delayed, um, uh, we see that uh, several participants are leaving the webinar already. So I would just uh, read uh, a few of them. Um, uh, uh, for both of you, Mika and Beatrice, uh, for a very final round of um, comments. So there are a few questions, a couple of questions which are referring to uh, power um, and how to, uh, in a way, um, uh, address those who are going to lose uh, power, comfort and recognition uh, from uh, more uh, gender equality. Uh, and also how can we address the risk that strategic framework mm, framing uh, would obscure unequal power dynamics in organization in organizations um, these are the the uh, main question and also uh, well but we would need an entire additional webinar to discuss this one from Lina about um, how to frame gender equality in a country with a strong anti-gender ideology. Um, a few brief uh, further comments from uh, both of you. Mike, please. Yeah. Okay, so the, the power question, I think it was Gloria Bonner, hi Gloria, uh, who asked the question about um, um, like, uh, what was it? Um, yeah, nobody wants to accept the change if uh, they feel it means they will lose uh, privilege or recognition. And um, I, I think it's not always so clear that this will be the case. Um, but also those people that are stick to, to such a realist approach to power, um, you, you can't reach them with framing. You, you, you have to have different uh, uh, strategies to try and change them. Uh, it's, it's, um, if, if Mr. Orban is uh, the, the chair of the board of your university, I, I think uh, it's no use to try and engage in strategic framing. Uh, I think you need to go for other strategies. That's why I said in the beginning, like the political opportunities matter, the, the mobilizing networks matter, and um, strategic framing is, is, is a strategy that works within democracies and that works within or democratic settings or, or settings in which uh, some kind of extreme power relations are somewhat mitigated. If they're not mitigated, I think it doesn't work at all. And we have to realize that. And then we have to think of other strategies. This also means that the question like, what, what do you do with um, um, this anti-gender equality uh, framing? I don't know what was that question again. Um, I think that's, that's uh, a very good question. And I wish I had the uh, answer to that. 
because it's um, you you can't neutralize everything with strategic framing. And um, if I, I think within all universities in Europe, I think at the moment it's still the case that there might be people that go for an anti-gender understanding of the world that don't that 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 wants the I don't know some kind of male traditional patriarchy to, to be in place again, but there will always be other people. So you have to connect to those other people. You can't uh, an ally with them and, and see who else might be against uh, these patriarchal forces taking over your university. Um, and, and this is a, a, a wider question beyond what we talk uh, about uh, today. So is um, um, I think the, the, the small question about um, does strategic framing obscure unequal power dynamics in organization? I think it doesn't need to because you, you, um, you, that's the advantage of saying, you know, we, we don't want patriarchy in our universities versus we want more role models for women in universities. If you want more role models for women in universities, it's a nice goal, but it, it, it can obscure, uh, uh, power relations. It can mean that you say, oh, it's kind of a, like an accident or a better example maybe is this whole idea of implicit bias, which, which says, oh, nobody wants to have gender bias, but some people have. And we tell them they have it and then they will not have it anymore. It's, there is implicit bias, but it's not the problem. It's not the only problem. So, so if you get caught somehow, um, in the simplicity of your framing that you have tried to have, uh, at some point you have to step out of it and say, actually, it's true, this is what we said, but it's more complex than that. We thought you wouldn't understand, that's why we didn't do that, but it's more complex and power is part of that. So, so you have to also um, step out of the consistency of what you have been saying at an, at, until a certain point to be able to, to be flexible enough to address other, uh, other things. And that includes also um, to have a touch of radicality. I, I think most of us that engage in these change uh, efforts, we, we try to be consensual, we try to be liked, we try to, to, to have good connections to the people that make the decisions. But it's also very important that there are radical elements at university that have much more radical messages um, so that you, you can use them or you can, you can play the interaction between this radicality and the people that are more consensual can bring about change. So next to having the wonderful uh, strategies, for instance, as they have in Zurich, you also need people that say, why, it's nice to have career planning, but why do we have careers at university? Why do we need careers? What's this idea of having careers? Why do, why do we think that a person managing something uh, needs to be paid more than a person doing research? Why is that? It's two different ways of, of uh, tasks, but why do we value more this or that? Why do we have such a hierarchical system? Um, why do we think that women can only have role models if they're also female? Um, wh why can women not have a role model that is a man uh, or the other way around? So we, we need this kind of more radical approaches as well in order to create more space for the whole framing uh, altogether. So that's, I think, where I will leave it. Thank you. Yeah, you referred to the de debunking what, all type of uh, prejudices prejudices that we might have in our own framing of things, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Also to to di distribute roles within, you know, the, the feminist change agents and, and, um, and embrace those people that are, you know, difficult uh, and that you think might not work. Uh, it's one thing to send them to negotiate with the board of the university, but it's another thing to make them invisible altogether. What I'm saying is, Maybe not a good idea to bring them to the board, but maybe also not a good idea to make them invisible. Maybe it's to your benefit also if they are loud and visible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Beatrice, uh, any final remarks and comments from your side? Yeah, based on my own uh, 
experience, and this is a very personal statement, I think whenever we are in the position, in a powerful position, we should really give our very best. And I think we, we have to take a deep breath. I'm used to it as an anesthesiologist. And um, we have to be consistent. But I, f I fully agree what I heard from you, Mike. Uh, sometimes, you know, you also have to realize, okay, here we cannot change anything. Mm -hmm. And then we, sh we should really stop because it's just a waste of energy. Mm -hmm. And at the end, probably you're marginalized or uh, are experiencing uh, uh, difficulties. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's worth it fighting and... Um, I don't know, after four years, after um, my first four years, I hope that I can say that, you know, that uh, some few puzzle stones uh, changed. And this would already be great, you know. And I think um, it's, it's because we design now in this board, I can design also the future by choosing new professors. And there we have to choose wisely because they will shape our environment. Thank you very much to uh, both of you again. I see that um, really um, we have a lot of very positive uh, comments uh, from our uh, participants and actually there are uh, more questions, but I think we should <laughs> close the webinar. Personally, I also have uh, some further very practical limitations to my smart working possibility at this time. <laughs> and my son just stepped into the room. So um, I would just uh, thank you again. I think it was extremely, extremely rich and uh, stimulating conversation. Um, probably too rich to be properly wrapped up. Uh, and uh, uh, just thank you again. I would just give the floor to uh, Vasia for her final uh, uh, remarks and recalling uh, the next um, uh, yeah, um, webinars and meetings from the GE Academy. Thank you again. Thank you from my side as well. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Honestly, this was very insightful and inspiring nonetheless. So, uh, with some promo uh, for those that are still on site, we have uh, the webinar Bias and Resistances Exploring Challenges of Gender Equality in Leadership and Decision Making in a Week, uh, which is a collaborative effort with the Gearing Calls project. So, we would really like to see you also there. The registrations are still open but there are uh, limited seats available, around uh, 20 or so. So please uh, hurry up to get a spot. But uh, of course, we will uh, publish everything on our YouTube channel. This is in uh, the agenda. And uh, the two speakers will be from Yellow Window, uh, Maxime Forrest and Lucy Ferguson. Very interesting presentations that you can also see uh, on our website. Thank you very much for the attention. All presentations will be uploaded in the recording of this webinar on YouTube. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice day.